Hey, welcome to the Motorcycles and Misfits podcast. <laughs> what did I do now? <laughs> Not too much excitement? Is that what the problem is? All right. And go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Motorcycles and Misfits podcast. Coming to you from the Recycle Garage in beautiful, sunny, and very crowded Santa Cruz, California. Tonight we've got a, well, I'm Stumpy John. I'm not the gimp, I'm the stump. And I'm John, so I'm here. <laughs> and uh, I'm your lovely uh, introducer today. So, and with us today, we've got to my right. That is Miss Emma. Hello, darlings. <laughs> I don't think you've ever been that quiet for that I long. know. No, I, I had no, I was giving John it may be some nervous. leeway to do his thing. I mean, you know, it's a big deal. The first time you do the introduction on the show, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. This is why I'm incredibly nervous right now. Well, don't be. <laughs> it's just you and me. It is. And how many and, thousand? And, and Liza gave me a stink eye. And coming to us via the Zoom camera is our favorite, favorite redheaded scooterist. Welcome, Bagel. Aloha, oi. And finally, we have the queen bee of the show, the person that I've determined is the benevolent dictator who dictates to all, but with benevolence and love. It is Liza. Hey, everyone. And I've decided that that's a good thing, a benevolent dictator. <laughs> it shows that you want to get, but when, get shit just, done, but you do care what people Wait do. a minute. I'm going to, no, I'm going to call you on that. Benevolence and love. I've never seen those traits in your life. <laughs> ever. Well, there's snarkiness and yeah, I've seen anger all, too. No, I've seen all those. <laughs> Benevolence and love. Are we talking about the same person? No, surely not. Surely we are. Well, tell you what, I'm going to leave you two to talk about the shit show called Santa Cruz. I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> Man, I was coming down today from Boulder Creek up in the Redwoods where I live. And, and you know, Santa Cruz is busy usually on the weekends, but this weekend was insanity. Yes, it was. Um, I think just about everybody decided to go to the beach today. And that's okay. But they chose to drive there. And so the simplest task of driving across town. Yeah. Um, we went for a little test ride. Um, we have a very nice lady called Mo who came in. And we fitted a rear tire to her bike. Or she fitted a rear tire to her bike and did splendidly with it. And we just did really a four-block test ride. And it took us nearly half an hour to do it. Oh. And the trouble is, you know, people get so um, frustrated and angry and quick with the horn. And Very you horny know, in Santa Cruz. Yeah, car horns have quite a polarizing effect on some people, I found. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's calmed down a little bit now, but mid-afternoon, it was a madhouse. Um, yeah, I came off the hill, and uh, as soon as I hit Ocean Street, it was just, it was literally a traffic jam from Ocean Street oh, to can, the boardwalk. I can only imagine. Bagel, darling, how yes. is the weather in Portland? Uh, well, in uh, Oregon, where I am. Uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, an hour, you're an hour south, aren't you? Yeah, two hours. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very lovely, sunny, and warm today. It's, Beautiful. Uh, yeah. It's Do been uh, nice. Have, have the horses been out? Bagel has horses oh. at the bottom, not of his garden, but the next door neighbor has yes. horses. Oh, yes. All the horses have been out. They've yes, been uh, clumping around the garden. Yes, prancing about. <laughs> As horses do. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Have, have you made some kind of peace with the horses yet? Or do you just kind of like admire oh, yeah. them from afar? Or have you offered them a carrot or something? Well, I haven't offered them any, any carrots yet. I wanted, you know, wanted to make sure that would be okay with the owners first. But, but I've gone up and said, said hello to them a couple of times. And they're friendly they appear enough. friendly horses? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Okay. And they'll say, they'll say hello and then go back to grazing. Okay, very good. Like because I should point out that the horse is actually the forerunner of the motorcycle. It is. Indeed. And, and, uh, and horses can be very gaseous, so sometimes you have to watch the other end. I just have yes. a quick question for John. Hey, John. Yeah. On a scale of one to ten, how riveting is this conversation? It's a fourteen <laughs> by far. I am riveted. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you, I assume well, you guys talked about the shit show. Oh, oh the traffic was just gruesome. So I had fun with it today. 
Oh, you did? I did. Well, you, I saw you oh, go my. on your little scooter today. On the, Here's the thing. On the Honda that was designed after a guinea pig. Here's pin. the <laughs> thing. Everybody needs a scooter. Mm -hmm. And today was the perfect reason yeah. why. We had to make a pizza run and go across traffic. And, I mean, this is the kind of shit show where there's so many people coming to Santa Cruz and not enough parking spots. So they're basically just blocking all the roads blocking every intersection just frustrated mad people so we uh we're just going you know between cars filtering in the oncoming lane because of course people are like trying to figure out how to go around they're in the over in the bike lane like why do you need to be blocking the bike lane mm -hmm. i don't know so i'll just take the sidewalk <laughs> oh and john had pizzas on on top of his head not this one but yes john. yeah 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 john dalton and uh <laughs> We were just, just whatever it took, crosswalk, everything. I just kept going, did not stop. And it was actually quite fun when you start like just looking for any path. Right. And you're like, right. oh, I'll just go across the street, use that crosswalk, jump the curb, and then I'll go between these cars. And <laughs> so you mean like riding in Pakistan? Yes, just like riding in Pakistan. Well, there you go. <laughs> you were actually carrying on a great British tradition that I remember vividly. Back in the early 90s, or it might even have been the late 80s, there was this huge craze for pizza in England, getting them delivered via gruesome little motorbike. Ooh. And so um, there were loads of Honda passports and Yamaha Zoomers was the pizza delivery thing of choice with these giant plastic boxes on the back that could hold about 30 pizzas with these things just riding like lunatics all you know, over the city here's the thing and i've talked before about understanding when you ride a big twin that feeling it gives you of having this big beast rumbly beast or let me tell you the feeling you have when you have just skirted through traffic over a sidewalk and right. through a red light right. with pizzas just as good oh easily mm -hmm. just as it's, good. it's a very satisfying feeling and as the person who sold you that scooter, if you remember, um, it, it's an absolutely first-rate machine. I still maintain that the person who designed it was probably playing with his child's guinea pig the day before <laughs> and thought, this is the perfect shape for a scooter. It but does the job. And so I had I had a good, fun time. But I could tell when people were arriving to the garage today, they're like, it took an hour to get here. There were, yeah, there were some ugly scenes Upon arrival at the garage, I'm not used to people arriving so frazzled. But um, I also had a great ride yesterday I'd like to share with everyone. Oh, where did you go? And it's especially good because it involves a child. Ooh, yes. A child! A child! We were, uh, we were upstaged by a child and I'm assuming yet again. permission, right, for this child to go? Well, not, not necessarily. Yes. <laughs> Are you um, abducted the child? Is that what you're telling us, Liza? Uh, There's an APB out for No, Liza. this is a, a kid who's been in my life since the day he was born. Uh -huh. um, and he's 11, going on 12. And I, you know, I realized, oh, he's about to turn 12. He's going to become a little shit pretty soon. <laughs> Got to get in while I, I can, while he's still fun and cute. And so I uh, reached out and asked my mom if I could take him to lunch on the motorcycle. Um, and she said, yes. Now you have to know, he has a history of going on the scooter with me. When he was so little, he would stand in front of me and hold on <laughs> to the mirrors and just stand <laughs> upright on the scooter. <laughs> and he loved it. That had to be the most unsafe Because his thing legs weren't long enough to sit on the seat and reach oh, the floorboard. So oh he just God. stood up between my legs. <laughs> um, but now he's big enough uh, that, you know, I put him in a nice leather jacket that we had out here and took the Africa twin. And I said, we're going for an adventure. Mm. And that's what adventure bikes are for. And headed off up uh, on back roads, mostly into mm. the hills of watsonville because you know the motto live to ride ride, ride to eat. eat it's exactly it uh so i took them to coralita sausage but we took some back roads there which was really fun <clears throat> and then we had sausage and soda Such pop an and, and potato chips you know and he was stoked about that and then i said um so our next stop is like you know the other side of town um, and we're going to go get pie at Gizditch. Mm. But I don't want to take the easy way there, which is just go back to the highway and go down. Right. 
let's go get lost. Let's have an adventure. Because sometimes that is the best adventure. Don't look at the maps, just go. And so at that inner four-way intersection, there's three roads I, I knew where they went. There's one I didn't know where it went. So we just headed on down there. Yeah, that's and a great road too. It was a great road. It turned out to become all, like at some point, it's just a single lane going through the mountains alongside creeks in the redwoods. It was beautiful. And then it spit us out down in the foothills where we wanted to be. Um, found myself on Casterly Road. I'm mm -hmm. like, I, I know where we are. Went to Gizditch, had some pie. And then this is where it got good for him. And, and you have to remember, uh, for an 11-year-old kid, this is kind of a big deal. A, mom trusting him to go out with me riding on a big bike. She said I couldn't take him over 25 miles an hour. So when I came back, I reported that she really needs to lift that band because everyone was honking and flipping the finger at me <laughs> on the freeway. Right. <laughs> um. No, I got him up to 80, and that was a thrill for him. Um, <laughs> wow. But as we're coming back, and remember, we did not take the highway there. We were taking these back mountain roads. And I said, so here's the thing. Um, if you don't have a map, like, how do you navigate? How do you know where you're going? Especially this is a kid who's never been where we were. Mm. And um, – I said, you know, you have the you have the, the mountains, which is across from the ocean, which you can kind of feel the ocean breeze. You can have a sense of direction. You have an internal compass. I'm going to let you navigate, see if you can get us home. So every time we came up to a junction, I'd, I'd ask him, left, right, or straight, where are we going? And he got to decide. And the thing that was cool was I was like, there's no such thing as a wrong answer because you may just lead us on another adventure and that's fine. We're in no rush to get home. We got full bellies. We've had good food. And that little kid navigated us on a different route all the way back to, we ended up at Coralitas again. Mm. And did you have another sausage? No, <laughs> but then from there, he re kind of remembered all the back roads we took there and navigated us back out to the freeway and, and, you know, at, at an 11 year old, I'm like, Hey, did you have a fun time? Yeah. But he's, you know, now he's like on his iPad and he's moved on. But then his mom uh, checked in with me later and said, he had the best day ever. That's awesome. <laughs> he told me that you let him decide where you're going and he found his way home. And I just remember like being that age when you really haven't had much power, but also you haven't had that much freedom uh, for a kid nowadays, especially to be given yeah. control, the power, mm -hmm. and to succeed at right. something he didn't even realize he had the ability to do. I remember, you know, um, five years, uh, four or five years older than that, when I actually got the keys to my first bike. And I suddenly found, you know, it's, it's, it's not even as if I'm with a grown up and I'm being given the power. I mean, so this is it. I can go exactly where I want. And it was quite bewildering at first. It was almost like I was looking around asking for permission. But, of course, that didn't last long. And I was tearing all over town on it. Yeah. But it's when you when you very, the very, very early days when you get those keys, it's almost you're frightened to ride by yourself because you, you're suddenly given this level of freedom Yeah. that, you, you've really never experienced before. So well done you for giving him that taste of getting his own bike when he's a little older. Well, and not just that, I explained to him how combustion engines work. That's An infernal oh, combustion cool. engine. And about cylinders. Like, I realized, like, I got this kid at this age where he's starting to understand things, you know? And um, I explained, explained, suck, bang, blow, you know? And that's what the exhaust is. And he goes, oh... Like he put it together. So I had it. That was a really special day for me to introduce Enzo to these things, but also to be able to take him out for a ride and maybe plant that seed. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm, you know, my first, uh, or one of my earliest memories really is sitting between my dad on his and his Triumph and, uh, and just taking me for rides. And I put my feet on the engine cases where it wasn't hot. And uh, we would just go zipping around and it was like the greatest thing in the world. And it's, it's part of the reason I'm even riding today is because of that, that first experience that just got me hooked in a minute. That's what I hope. And right. um, John, since you haven't been around long enough, you may witness this. 
Um, Emma, in a couple of weeks is the Pride Parade. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That we always go down and ride in the Pride Parade. And two years ago, because they didn't have it last year, um, and, and the Pride Parade here is short. It's only like six bucks long, maybe, <laughs> you know, five bucks. Uh, but two years ago when he was nine, I taught him how to ride the little electric mini bike. Oh, oh he upstaged us. And so. he had on like some, uh, some angel rainbow angel wings, <laughs> but all the full gear and everything. Well, we all get dressed up in like wigs and fishnets and boas and the whole thing. But the, again, the best part for him was we ride from the garage across town to the beginning of the parade mm -hmm. and we let him ride the mini bike on city streets <laughs> when he was oh, nine wow. years old That's awesome. in the middle of our pack. <laughs> right. We were kind of protecting him. Yeah. So yeah, we need to do that again, don't we? We're, we're leading the parade again, I guess. I, yeah, I hope so. So I, I want to invite him, ask him if he wanted to ride the mini bike again. And he said, yeah, I bet he did. Yeah. So that yeah. it's fun. I mean, John, did you do that with your your kids? Was your your other kids old enough when you I, got them? Yeah, I did. I did, but you know, my son was wasn't quite interested as much at that time. So I stuck him on the back a couple of times, and he was like, "No, this isn't for me." So I just let it go. But yeah, that, that what you didn't force him? I know. <laughs> well, that well, is I, I, to his credit. I had a I had a sportster at the time with sort of a. It didn't have a great back seat, so he would he'd have to hold on to me really tight to slide off. So it was kind of the wrong experience because he felt like he was sliding. He was probably right. probably ten. And you know the thing is the the important thing to remember is motorbiking is not for everyone. Wait, what? As <laughs> difficult as it is to take on, it is not for everyone. Well, that's what scooters are for. Yes, exactly. For the other half. Yes. Hey now. No, I'm saying you're. <laughs> Scooters or motorcycles? Scooters yeah. are not for scooters are not for everybody either. Oh, I think right. that's are. what motorcycles are for. We've got everybody covered between scooters and motorcycles. Oh, I, I think there's a, a large contingent of people who just you know are, oh, aren't even. There are yeah. the boat people. Well, there's, well, there's those, that. Yeah, there's those slingshots there's, too. There's, those abominable there's motorcycles. There's there's the, cagers though. The, oh, the cam, oh, the Camry people. <laughs> yeah. You guys stop. You guys stop. <laughs> the Camry people. Um, I wanted to. Um, yes. I wanted to get into uh, our subject tonight. So do I. I know you do because we get to do a history hole. Well, a so, mini one. Well, I, I hope you talk longer. Um, so it is Memorial Day weekend. It is indeed Memorial and Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend is to celebrate the fallen armed services. Yes. Uh, members, service members. And I thought, you know, we've never really done much on military right. motorcycles. Right. But they're out there. They've right. always been there. In fact, I've got G.I. Joe's around here <clears throat> to prove it. Right. In fact, there's a long history of many things in the motorcycle community that can be traced back to like choppers and bobbers. Yes. There's so many things, but Emma, I wanted to talk more specifically, not as much about the culture, but more about the motorcycles uh, from mil been military right. motorcycles. Oh yes. So go for it. Tell us about it. Well, wait, wait, it's deep. It's dark. It's dank. I keep all my shit in there. <laughs> It's Emma's History Hole. Hello, darlings. <laughs> yes, it's time for another Emma's History Hole. So sit back, pin back your lug holes, and listen. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start this one off with a very simple question. Why do we like motorbikes? Freedom? No, you can't say fun or, f fun or freedom. Those are the two things you can't say. So why do we like motorbikes? <laughs> I can actually specifically answer that. It goes back to when I was very young. For me. Yes. Because it's something that's not the norm. Right. And that, that, that dovetails in. Any just far more practical reasons? They're, they go anywhere. Right. They're, you know, they're relatively quick. Yes. They're fast. Yeah. They go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Relatively inexpensive. Yes. In and some cases, anyway. Easy to fix if, right. if you get breakdown. And they're economical. Yeah, affordable. I mean, not just for us, but in so many countries. And so for 
all of those reasons, for every single one of those reasons, including that there's this always this air of, of nonconformity about the military have always loved motorcycles and have always included motorcycles as part of a military lineup. And over the years, motorbikes have played very different parts in different militaries. Um, I sent you a picture, which I hope you'll include on our website, Liza. Oh, wait. I will look it up while you're talking. Oh. And it was just one example of there's a young man sitting by a motorcycle and it was taken inside a glider. It's a very poignant day and it's coming up June the 6th, 1944, which was in effect D-Day. And that picture was taken at 3 a.m. on June the 6th inside a horse glider. He's a British paratrooper. He's sitting next to a matchless. Um, sadly, he didn't make it. But nevertheless, it shows all the roles. I mean, this bike is chained down inside a glider. It's an absolutely amazing picture. Uh, here, you hold it. Wow. Maybe. So hopefully we will include that, but that's just one example. So hold so, it up to the camera. Oh yes, absolutely. Let's see if that will work. Uh, Can you zoom in on that? No, I cannot. <laughs> oh, I can't oh. stretch any further. Oh, well. so, that's okay. Yeah, but we can go back. We can go back beyond the Second World War. We can go actually back. Um beyond the First World War, really to the turn of the century, when military, the biggest conundrum facing military, and it's the, the, it's exactly the same now as it was then. How do you move people around quickly? How do you move a lot of people around to where you want them to be in a short space of time? Now, of course, at the turn of the century, the Wright brothers hadn't flown yet. And larger vehicles were still very, very rudimentary and didn't really have the power to carry multiple people. So the idea of having small, relatively fast for the time, and remember, running pace was fast at the turn of the century, a cheap easy to repair motorcycle to get troops to the front line quickly was just an irresistible combination and all the major english manufacturers worked on these bikes um, and tried to come up with the best design solution now triumph had a particularly good design that was developed used extensively in the first world war um, a very, very simple bike, an incredibly rudimentary. It was a one-cylinder bike. It had belt drive transmission. It had wheels that looked like they belonged on a bicycle. Very rudimentary brakes. But what it actually did was it extended the period of, of mobility for a trooper from how far he could walk in a day to really an unlimited distance and that became such an irresistible thing and if you had a front so if you were fighting on a front that was 20 miles away from headquarters you constantly needed to send dispatches backwards and forwards because of course the generals aren't going to be at the front fighting with the troops so they're making the decisions from 20 miles back so you needed to get communication backward and forward quickly, sometimes in person. And again, that's where motorcycles came in with the dispatch rider bikes. Army still uses dispatch rider bikes for that exact purpose today. I mean, in this amazing digital world. Um, the Second World War was very, very interesting, though, because... It only, I mean, the outbreak of the Second World War was 21 years after Armistice 1918, the First World War. But it was just, it was a completely different conflict. And technology had moved so far ahead by then. Um, to give you an idea of some of the machines that were used in the Second World War, um, Triumph again offered 
the single cylinder bikes, which were very, very popular. One of the major suppliers was Norton with a 16H motorcycle. So 500cc single and a 350cc single. Um, the picture of the young man in the glider was with a matchless, which again was another single cylinder bike. It's quite interesting that the British manufacturers, even though a lot of them had twin cylinder bikes, particularly Triumph, they were considered a little complex for frontline duty. Here's an interesting side note. A slightly modified Triumph twin engine was used as a generator on a Lancaster bomber. So mm. most bombers had their own, um, flying bombers had their own um, electrical circuits, of course, with the generator. And they used a modified Triumph engine for that purpose. But the twin cylinder one. Um, German Army used, again, they used solo and sidecar bikes to great effect the german army i mean what is more is a stronger image of a german sidecar outfit and they use them in the north campaign but they use them very very effectively in the desert as well because they're these huge balloon tires and they were manufactured by bmw as a 750 flat twin and zundep and again as a 750 flat twin um, in basically single wheel drive configurations and two wheel drive. That abomination that is up at uh, Talbot Museum, that's a copy of a copy of that? Yes. Mm, the Chinese one? The yeah. Chinese one. Yeah. I mean, it's worth talking about the Russian bikes because they said, oh, they're a copy. And if you go back far enough to the 1930s, yes, it was. But it formed its own development. And the Soviet Army in the Second World War used a very similar bike as well. And so it wasn't a direct copy of the BMW. It was actually its own thing. Um, but the German Army used them as uh, machine gun platforms. It was a very, very stable platform. But again, it's this irresistible combination of easy to fix, R relatively easy. I mean, if you've ever looked inside even the Second World War tank engine, you will realize what a complex mm. thing a tank is. And an, even an armored car a, or a Jeep, as simple as a Jeep is, compared to a motorcycle, I mean, it's an amazingly complex machine. So you have, have this irresistible combination of something that's very, very simple to fix. It's very, very cheap to manufacture can get around very, very quickly and can get through places that a four-wheel car can't. So I found a picture <clears throat> when I was doing some research of the flea from Second World War, and it's, it's a picture of a, of, a, uh, of a soldier actually lifting the flea up. Yeah, so we're going to come to the lightweights right now because that was one of them. So the flea was a lightweight bike, um, and again, just... The, the advantage with the flea, it had big wheels, so it could go over a rutted field. There was also this amazing thing called the Excelsior Well Bike. And the Excelsior Well Bike was dropped from a glider in like a tube. And it land with the paratrooper and he'd assemble it, mm -hmm. pull the handlebars up. It was almost like a little folding bike. Do you remember? What like were those? A, the like a scooter? Yeah, it was a proper motorbike, but it had oh, a tiny uh, motor compo. Like it was like a World War II motor compo. Yes. Yeah. That's what it was like. Um, limitedly, it wasn't hugely effective because it had tiny little wheels. However, it was better than walking. And that's the important thing. When you're dealing with critical moments where every second, Every minute, every hour counts. Even if you've got something that's getting bogged down all the time, um, it's it's better than walking. I'm not sure whether w walking would have been better in Santa Cruz today, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I true. think I think faced with the war zone that was Santa Cruz today, um, walking would have been better. Um, the German counterpart to the flea is a very, very interesting bike, and it lived a very, very long life. And it was made by a company called DKW, 
which stands right. for Das Kleiner Wunder, the mm-hmm. little wonder. Big Matt got a DKW, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> so um, it was a little one, two, five, little dispatch bike. And again, it was a very, very lightweight bike for just buzzing around. Um, nothing like the heavyweight BMWs of the time. When the war finished in 1945, it was such an effective little bike. The design of it was considered war reparations. You know, um, Germany had to, in effect, pay for all the trouble they caused the rest of the world. And so they had divvied up their assets and it was divided among the allies. And England and America shared the design of the DKW 125. In America, um, it became the Harley Hummer. Oh. And in America, uh, in England, it became the BSA Bantam. Ah, that and it one. lived a very, very long life. And um, it was also the motor for the Harley Topper that we talked about uh, the other week. Oh, okay. it was, there you go. But it was a yeah. manual transmission, but they used it as yeah. the, the basic, the basis. Um, but the Harley Wizard, the 125 Wizard, was basically a complete knockoff of the DKW. And in fact, if you look at the Harley Wizard and the very early BSA Bantams and the DKW 125, it's quite obviously exactly the same, same engine. Um, and that engine in various forms, I mean, you know, it was developed as the BSA Bantam, but went right on until about 1970 or 71, I believe. So it was a very, very long lasting engine. So, I mean, I think, and again, remember with a history hole, I just give you a taste of what I want you to look at. And you can scrutinize this as much as you want, but where there is conflict with armies you'll find motorbikes even now and you will find motorbikes being used very very effectively i forgot to uh, mention the americans of course how could i do that at liza it's not <laughs> awful of me horrible the, the harley <laughs> davidson wla 45 there that is as american as apple pie um Indian also did a comparable army bike and they took some risks. You know, Indian were very, very good at experimentation and actually wasting a bit of money. They, they did not have a good war. They were not awarded the same kind of contracts that Harley were, but they came up with some very, very interesting design concepts. A V twin turn the other way and shaft drive almost like a motor Guzzi. Um, was an Indian first in the Second World War. Well, so all the armies had them. All the armies used them. They are a part of every fighting force that has fought a battle. There's another bike that has its roots in from the military. And what bike would that be? Do you remember the Marmon Twin? Oh, yes. John, you may not know about this one. No, I don't know. About so that. this is a history hole I did many, many yeah, years ago. Yeah, a while ago. ago. This is fascinating. So the Marmon Twin was actually designed by one of the Marx brothers. Zeppo. Wow. Zeppo Marx. Wow. And um, he was an engineer by trade, and he was part of the Marx brothers in the early days, but he wasn't considered very funny, so he didn't last very long. Um, but he... Um, as well as designing this bike post-war, during the war, he came up with a design for a very, very effective bomb cradle that actually mm-hmm. was used not on the Enola Gay on the boxcar, mm-hmm. which dropped the second bomb on Nagasaki. And that, it had a very, the cradle was almost like a parallelogram because, you know, uh, apparently I think it was Little Man was the Hiroshima bomb and F- was it Little Boy and Fat Man, I think? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. But one of them was a lot more fragile. And I think it was Fat Man. Fat Man and Little Boy. And yeah. I think Fat Man was so fragile, I had to come up with this very, very gentle cradle to actually extend it out of the fuselage of the aircraft before they dropped it. And that was the Marmon. Post-war, of course, you know. Um, the Marmon company came up with this... Um, it looked like a whizzer, 
Um, well, I believe he got the, this is a, uh, really a motorcycle that he, he didn't manufacture any parts. He, you know what? I parts. just realized I've been calling it the Harley Davidson wizard. It's the Harley Davidson Hummer. Forgive me. Oh. I've got mm. wizards on the brain because I'm always working on them, but it was actually the Harley Davidson Hummer 125. So please forgive me for that shocking omission. <laughs> but so, um, yeah, so there was the Marmon clamp he developed the Marmon, the Marmon bomb clamp. And the Marmon, which looked like a Wizzo with a flat twin engine. From I believe. The back. I believe he got the the frames from Schwinn. Yeah, and mm -hmm. but do you remember where the motor came from? I don't. It was a flat twin. God, I did that history hole so long ago. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. It was a. Uh, it says simultaneously firing two stroke boxer weighing thirty pounds and cranking out three and a half horsepower. These were. Uh, target drone engines. That's right. So they had <laughs> drone airplanes that were target practice, and they <laughs> had uh, a surplus of these. And he bought them up and put them into these motor, motor into these Schwinn bikes, and created the Marmon uh, Twin. See, this is what engineers wow. do. Yeah, so it has its its roots from the military. You as know, well. so many innovations that we enjoy today can be traced back directly to the Second World War. Yeah. So many. Every time you get on an airliner, every time you get on an airliner, pressurized cabins, you know, remote control um, surfaces, um, all these were developed in the Second World War. Motorcycles as well. Fully enclosed chain cases. Um oil bath inside the engine you know n valves that aren't exposed that are actually contained within waterproof electrics on a bike all these are military innovations you know because they in a critical theater of war the bike had to work correctly so you couldn't get away with exposed valves anymore and you couldn't get away with just hanging some magneto on the front that would spark everywhere that as soon as you went through a puddle so you had you basically had to make things work very very well very very quickly. So there you go. So it's like I say it's a, it's sort of a mini history hole, but it's a mighty history hole. Um, Memorial Day is always very very important, and you know I I don't ever think we should forget its proximity to June the sixth as well, which is a very poignant day. Nineteen forty four. D Day. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, that's that's really when how how can you put it? The tide turned. Right. Well, thank you for that history hole. I know that there's like I said, a lot of roots in military and motorcycling. A lot of things can be traced back to that, but not just motorcycles. Oh no. Mm -mm. I'm guessing these Italians got something to do with it. Bagel. Are there military scooters? Yes, indeed, there are military scooters. Oh, my God. But, Wait a minute. How yes. deep and dank is your hole, Bagel? Uh, <laughs> my hole is just as deep and dank, <laughs> I have to say. It's, it's probably a little more red, though. Because I think it's time for Bagel's History Hole. Yes, indeed. This is a history hole about military scooters. Uh, and this history, in fact, goes back more than a hundred years, if, if you if you would if you can believe it. Um, what is considered to, in fact, perhaps be the first scooter ever, uh, was designed for the um, uh, the First World War, um, per specs uh, for the U.S. Army, uh, which was to be used as a dispatch scooter, and this was built by the Autoped Company of New York. And what they did was they adopted a, a junior push scooter, uh, adding a miniature 1.5 horsepower engine that sat right above the front wheel and made the front wheel the drive wheel for the bike. And the, the soldier would ride uh, this, this thing standing up, uh, which was a precariously unstable design, but it served its purpose, uh, like I said, as a dispatch vehicle during World War I. And uh, so that... That may be the very, very first scooter ever. Um, I mean, there, there's a bunch of different vehicles, and the history is kind of murky about what was the first, but, but it's one of the very earliest uh, scooter 
type vehicles was this military bike uh, for World War One. Now, uh, the next Wait, bike. Are you telling me that the the Razor was is a hundred years old? N not the Razor. This is this is a, a bit larger than the Razor. Okay. But but same basic layout. It sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I imagine it was, but you know, this was World War One, which was pretty terrifying in and of itself. <laughs> so, so it was just you know, everything in, in perspective, I suppose. Um, the uh, the second bike that I have on my list is the one that you had mentioned, Emma, the Excelsior Well Bike, um, because that is considered by many to be a scooter as well. Um, because it is it's such a low design that it is practically a step through design. Um, and this was made by Brockhouse Engineering, uh, produced for the RAF during World War II uh, from 1942 to 45, <clears throat> which was served as a paratrooper bike, uh, which was contained in a metal canister that was uh, dropped out of planes with troopers and uh, yeah. provided transportation on the ground. But and, again, uh, limited effective because of these tiny wheels, but... <laughs> True, you, but... you could scoot along on it. I mean, you know, there there are pictures of paratroopers actually not falling off them, I think, which oh, is yeah. remarkable. There's plenty of pictures of them falling off the things. Yep. Yeah, it had handlebars that, that folded forward when it was uh, packed away and a seat that, that collapsed. And you just raised up the seat and the handlebars and off you went. And uh, this bike uh, actually uh, continued after World War II, uh, where it was renamed uh, the Corgi. Yes. And they also partnered with Indian motorcycles and marketed it in the U.S. as the Papoose. <laughs> <laughs> well, we so, can't have that anymore. <laughs> no, but this was a different time, I suppose. Um, the, the third bike on my list is from Italy. Now, this is ah, not a Vespa, is. but this is not a Vespa. Oh. This is a, an Italian World War II paratroop scooter. Uh, this what? is the, the Aeromoto Paratrooper Scooter. Uh, it was made between 1942 and 1944. Uh, they only produced about 2,000 of them. But this was a tiny uh, scooter with folding handlebars and uh, two front wheels that were bonded together as one. Very, very strange design. Um, but it had a, uh, a 100 to 125 cc motor, depending on what they had available. Um, it had a rigid uh, steel tube frame, a two-speed gearbox, a drum brake, and a 9.5-liter tank that had the seat right on top of the tank. And it also included a hitch that it would use to pull a cart behind it for ammunition or passengers or whatever you needed. So that was the first Italian uh, uh, military scooter. But, uh, but the next scooter on my list is a U.S. scooter for World War, for, from World War II uh, that was made by Cushman. This, this was the Cushman Model 53 Airborne Scooter, uh, also known as the U.S. Army Model G683, which was produced in 1944 and 1945. And this was a modified Cushman Autoglide Model 34 scooter with a reinforced frame that uh, would allow it to withstand, withstand the power drop. And it required two chutes because of how heavy it was. Uh, it was powered by a Cushman 16M71 uh, one-cylinder four-stroke 242cc engine uh, producing 4.6 horsepower. And these were used widely by the U.S. military, including in Normandy on D-Day. Uh, and in the Mediterranean and the Pacific as well. Uh, they produced uh, 4,734 of those in all. And uh, Cushman also provided various two- and three-wheeled scooters to the Army, Navy, and Army Air Forces uh, for general transportation use as well. I love that they had a huge hipster seat on it, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah. yellow. I mean, it's a nice brown like you're supposed to. Yep. Nice big leather saddle seat. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I think, am I right in saying that David has joined us? He has. Well, I'm going to introduce hey. him in a second. I wanted to make sure Bagel was done. Yeah, I've got a few more bikes to, to list oh, off Oh, good here. Lord, Bagel. This is you a shiny hole, Bagel. You wanted the history hole. Here's the history. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think Bagel's hole is deeper No, I think it's cool. I, that Cushman, I kind of, like, I want to see one. That would be fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, look up the model Cushman Model you 53 know, Airborne. The, yeah. the big trouble with all... All of these military bikes, particularly from the Second World War, the attrition rate was incredible. It was, yeah. I mean, it was considered the, the gliders themselves were considered one flight. 
and the scooters themselves were almost considered one trip. Disposable. It's completely yeah. disposable. You you fly over the channel in the glider. Glider crash lands. Glider's done. There's no way mm -hmm. of it's getting out of there. Right. You jump on the scooter. You ride to your objective. Scooter's done. So finding one now would be... Yeah. There's probably a ton buried in Normandy somewhere. Yeah. There might be a few, but there there are a few survivors out there. I've seen some pictures anyway, online. Sorry, Bagel. Uh, no worries. But uh, there was that was not the only U.S. scooter built uh, for World War II, or at least created for World War II, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, there was a competitor to Cushman that uh, tried to get the, the, the same bid Cushman was fighting for. And this was made by Frank Cooper of Cooper's Motors of Los Angeles. And he produced the Cooper War Combat Motor Scooter. Oh, that sounds cool. Right, which was a modified Powell Aviate scooter, uh, which he added a Wisconsin 290cc engine to, which in Freedom Units is 17.8 cubic inches. And uh, this was uh, it's produced five horsepower, 7.7 uh, .7 foot pounds of torque, and it used an altered Plymouth transmission. And weld, he welded triangular reinforcing bars to the frame in order to strengthen it to withstand, withstand the power drop. Oh, it so this is similar to the Cushman, right? Yeah, it was yeah. similar to the Cushman. It was a competitor to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and both bikes also featured uh, four uh, six, or six inch <laughs> by six tires that were interchangeable with U.S. Air Force running uh, running gear tires. You know what it looks exactly like is yeah. Jim's Coleman scooter. Yes, it <laughs> the, looks very much like that. This is the Coleman scooter. Yeah. yeah, it's gone a lot. Yeah, and the army actually rated this a better bike than the Cushman, but after they visited Frank Cooper's factory in uh, in Los Angeles, the War Department was not impressed, and they decided to award the contract to Cushman mm. instead. So um, then there's one a third bike, a uh, third scooter that I found that was used in World War II. Uh, this was made by Salisbury. Uh, Wait, their the, model the stake people. Uh, oh, not gosh. the big people. <laughs> These are the scooter people. From this is an American scooter that was made in the 30s and 40s, uh, called Salisbury. S A L S B U R Y. Uh, they made the Model 72 scooter during World War II that was sold in small numbers to the U.S. Navy uh, for base base transportation, and they also made an ambulance version of their motor glide scooter as well. I, I haven't I haven't oh, seen a picture cool. of that, but but I've read about it, and that sounds very interesting. Now. Uh, last but not least are the Italian scooters that you've probably seen and thought of before when military scooter first pops into your mind. The first one is the ACMA Vespa 150 TAP. Uh, now, ACMA is the, the French manufacturer that built Vespas under license for the French market and uh, also built, uh, French, uh, built Vespas for the French military uh, that were for, uh, for aviation troops. And uh, they produced these military Vespas from 1956 to 1959, which were fitted with a U.S.-made <gasps> M20 inch or 75 millimeter recoilless rifle. Now, did this, you guys find the picture? Oh yes. Yeah. Now this this rifle basically <laughs> runs the the length of the bike from from under wow. from the back underneath the rider's seat through a hole in the leg shield and extends way out past the front uh, the front okay. wheel of the bike. You buried now, the lead. This is the coolest scooter I've ever seen in the world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it also was, uh, was set up to carry ammunition as well. It had the cases along on the sides. And um, the, uh, it was basically a recoilless rifle. So, uh, and it was not meant to be fired from the scooter. What? Oh, what caliber is that? Is that uh, a 50? What is that? I'm not sure what the caliber is. Bigger but than it's, a 50. It's, it's yeah. three inches or 75 yeah. millimeters. Oh, it's a cannon. Yeah. It's a cannon. It's a, it's a cannon. It's yeah, basically, it's like a you know, yeah, it's a bazooka, basically. It's an anti, and, it's anti tank. It says, yeah. So, wow. so. And there's a, there's a great Super blurb cool. that I found on uh, Wikipedia about these. Uh, it says the scooters would be parachute dropped in pairs accompanied by a two man team. The gun was carried on one scooter while the ammunition was loaded on the other. Due to the lack of any kind of aiming devices from the recoilless rifle, uh, was never it was never designed to be fired from the scooter. The gun was mounted on an, an oh. M1917 Browning machine gun tripod, which was also carried by the scooter before being fired. However, in an emergency, it could be filed while in the frame and while the scooter was moving. <laughs> yes! That's awesome. <laughs> the problem is, is yeah. you got to sit on the barrel. 
Yeah. Right. This is good right. if you have uh, issues with your manhood, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> unless you get poor, off on that kind of poor, thing. Never... Poor Italians. <laughs> no judgment here. <laughs> <laughs> but but the last the, 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 the uh, Vespa also uh, Vespa of Italy that is also produced a similar bike that was a basically a mobile tank killer. Uh, that they produced in the 1960s and 70s, uh, also mounted with a, a similar bazooka type uh, gun under the seat and through the frame. Why don't you have one of these, Bagel? Um, well, seems to be the ultimate Vespa. You need one of these, Bagel, really bad. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> But well, actually, a friend turn of into mine, a potato gun. That would be kind of cool well, too. Well, you, you know that you mentioned that a friend of mine up in Portland made a a basically his own version of this bike out of a Vespa P two hundred or a Vespa P one twenty five, I should say. And uh, it, it's it's an amazing bike, and he named it uh, he named it the Thunder Turd. So if you look at pictures <laughs> of the Thunder Turd, you can probably find it online. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bagel. That was awesome. Um, yeah, what your I, hole is awesome, Bagel. I just want to say. <laughs> I'm glad I find, you enjoyed it. What I find interesting is I think, you know, we still have, hold on to like, yeah, a military bike has to have like a cannon between your legs, you know? And like, um, I was looking at, I have a bunch of uh, GI Joes here and one of them up there. And I think this is what, uh, is that the WLA, the 47? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the so WLA this is standard. Four, it's and, a standard. And basically, classic. it's got saddlebags and a rifle holder on the front. That's military. But then you get into this one from 1982. Emma, where's the toy you got? I got this. This is a GI Joe motorcycle. That right, and mm -hmm. this has got all the accoutrements that a 1982 GI Joe should really have. Um, it's got a very plushy seat, but. I think it's got some kind of cannon that you pump up here. You know, there's like a pump and you Ooh, kind of pump it yeah. up and then. And so, of course. And then shoot cannons and the headlight looks like a laser beam. And we do know GI Joe is not real, right? Just checking. I know, sure. I know. But my point <laughs> he, is he might be that real. even <laughs> by 1982, like it was still cool to put like, you know, a cannon, you know, some pr projectile thing on a motorcycle. And so. I started thinking about, well, that's not really practical for today's military. So I wanted to discuss what would be the, you know, the optimal military bike. And to do that, I thought we needed to bring in a military guy. So joining us is Davey the Marine. Davey, hoorah! Hey, Davey. Hoorah. How's it going, guys? There it is. Hey. What's going on? So No, not much. So, Davey, so I know that we all think like, yeah, we want to have rocket launchers, but that's not really practical um, for today's military. And I know that, I mean, there's different different well, functions that might serve. Just stop, 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 what? Liza. David, how's, how's your, David has the most fantastic super glide. How's your bike doing, David? <laughs> it's doing well. It's, uh, you know, I always want to do something else to it. And it's just about figuring out what I could you know, save money in doing because it is a Harley. So I have that Harley tax. So, you know, wanting to do anything to it is right, right, more right. expensive than it needs to be. So, that, but I'm glad it's, it's doing well. It's surfing oh, yeah. well. Oh, that's right. Writing it okay. every day with the warm weather. So it's nice. There you go. Now we can proceed. Maybe we, let's have David share what branch he's in and what he's doing. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm a Marine, United States Marine Corps. I am a corporal. I enlisted at the age of 18 uh, with the ambition to be a pilot, and they told me I need a degree to do that. So they put me in the next nearest thing to the aviation, which is motor transportation. <laughs> I drive trucks. Yeah. <laughs> That's that good old recruiter magic. Yeah, this is right next to aviation. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same thing. <laughs> um, at least you're not walking, though. <laughs> yeah, no, very true. Yeah, if I can't truck it, fuck it. Is that photo, so. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you're concussing it. Sorry. You're, you're <laughs> uh, good. Okay, so um, went to school, went to San Jose State, graduated with a degree in aviation, and I am currently awaiting orders to attend officer candidate school in Quantico, Virginia. Oh, that's I awesome. got my flight contract, right so I'll be uh, starting my pilot training hopefully this time next year after all the training that you have to do as a entry-level lieutenant. Nice. Well, on behalf wow. of all the misfits, let me say thank you for your service. And uh, hey. yeah, I like fighting for the misfits. So I like, I like, uh, <laughs> I like being able to, you know, talk to you guys. And I, you know, I've been around your guys' organization for mm -hmm. so long now. I love 
just being yeah. able to do this for you guys. It's not even. Davey's so. been coming here since he was in, in high school. Yeah. 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 So, um, but I, yeah, I thought, so what, what are today's needs? Cause I don't think you need to have a gun on there. Right. And I know that there's going to be more specific missions. So if we're trying to come up with a bike, the idea I had was for extraction. If somebody is in a danger zone, I guess you call behind the line, right? <laughs> and you need to be able to drop something into them. Like, would, is this something that you think is like a, a, an actual practical need to be able to drop something in? So for everything that has to do with tier one or anything having to do with extraction and stuff like that, a lot of it has to deal with, um, you know, being quiet, you know, stealth is mm -hmm. your main thing. And right. obviously this is not my main pace because I'm trying to fight aircraft and I drive trucks. So I'm not exactly yeah. the most quiet guy out there. <laughs> when you talk to these tier one operators and everything like that, they they're like, oh yeah, no, I, you know, we hike 20 miles just to go anywhere. And it's like, yeah, I won't walk farther than 200 feet to my truck. And then <laughs> <laughs> go from there. So if you, and what you're asking for, you'd want something lightweight, capable, but also reliable. You know, what happens if you're going along and you lose a tire or what happens if, you know, you have to ditch it for a little while, where can you find this? Where can you stash it? Where someone's not going to come across and be like, what is this doing? For current operations, you know, if we're out in the desert, you don't want anything sticking out, but you also don't want it to lose it. So maybe having something that you could track, something that you could be able to do that. But again, when you put something that has a beacon on it, someone else can pick up those frequencies. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's a balancing act. Um, yeah, I mean, I love the idea of the total GI Joe, like you guys are saying, where it comes in the canister and, and, yeah, bust right? it out and right. they put it all together. It has a big, stupid gun that you could, you have to be looking at the guy to be able to shoot it. You know? <laughs> oh, that'd be so. cool. Well, you know, you, you are kind of getting a little bit sort of Chuck Norris -y in your appearance now, David. So, I mean, you could pull it off, darling. Right. Did, yeah. No. Chuck no. Norris. Ah! <laughs> no, it's like so if i don't have to shave i won't so <laughs> so let's say through whatever situation you end up being the guy that they're like we need to get somebody to get into this zone and get our mm -hmm. pilot out and you're mm -hmm. the only one who knows how to ride a motorcycle what is that motorcycle that you want to get in and out also you're gonna have to be able to carry water and supplies on it and to bring the pilot out on Harley Super Glide, of That's course. What I was oh, say. Stop. There it is. <laughs> of course, you know that Harley's making enduro now, so oh you know, yeah, you we, have to pay. Oh, we rode it, dude. You, yeah, it was nice. Oh, oh okay. Um, so I was thinking something maybe along the lines of if you've ever been on a ski lift, you know how they tow the person in the back rather than having a sidecar because you got to factor in you have your gear, you have your water, you need to place a passenger on it and say if he's incapacitated, you can't exactly put him on your back mm. and be riding through. So maybe if you could have something in tow, you could be able to pull more gear that, that way. That's smart, Rat, as opposed to a sidecar, which has been somewhat traditional, because you can maneuver a lot better and right. faster on a bike with a swivel uh, trailer. Right. I like that. What are they using right now? Other than the, it, I'm mm. sure they're not using the KLR anymore. Well, um, yeah, go some ahead. zeros. Yeah. Well, the, the operators are using zeros, I think. I mean, we know that there are military zero FX and DSRs. Right. Um, they're used by police. They're used by everybody because they're quiet. But uh, depending upon where you are, I mean, if uh, we're just assuming, like, I'm just going to say, like, this may be happening in um, Afghanistan, right? Um, so having uh, an electric bike, even though it's stealth, um, you're not going to be able to recharge very easily, are you? well and diesel is the military's number one thing so right. military loves their diesel so if they could find a way to maybe you could power it to a jenny maybe you just drain that whole drenny uh, are they running jenny around are, are they running around with anything right now in you know getting circles you're in no no we don't yeah they don't let us anywhere near any kind of motorcycles even just to ride on base you have to do a basic safety road right. motorcycle course so we're not Nothing that I've been around that I've been able to get my hands on, which I would love to, especially as a motor transportation operator. It's like, yes, absolutely. Let me get on that motorcycle. But no, I haven't seen anything. And I think that was more of Desert Storm. And I could be completely sure. off base on that. But 
So, uh, you know, I know that like um, KLR type bikes have been something often used, but I'm going to throw something else out there. Um, I don't know what they're called because this is a hybrid. Have you seen these very small displacement? They're basically um, a mountain bike with a, a motor on it. Um, they have pedals, um, but they also are made to be like uh, hunting vehicles, stuff like that. They're you don't know what I'm talking about. Gas powered or electric? They're gas powered, like uh, small displacement mm -hmm. um, bikes that are basically a mountain bike. I'm almost thinking something so lightweight that you can easily uh, hide it or move it or lift it, depending upon what terrain you're dealing with, you know? Um, but what would, if you're going to be hauling a, a trailer with possibly a second right. person, what's the minimum size the engine has to be? I mean, if you're hauling a trailer over the rough terrain, it'd be a minimum of a 250. Minimum. 250. So, M minimum. Dave, you, are, you th are we thinking like a dirt bike then? Like a 250 dirt bike? Do you think that's optimal? You know, if, like, I, I've ridden 250s and all that fun stuff, I would almost have to say a 450 because you figure if you're fully kitted up just yourself, you're yeah. adding about another 60, 70 pounds, not to mention if you have to pull anyone out what do they have? You know, it, it depends on what gear they're going to bring with them or what they're not. Say you're mm -hmm. rescuing a pilot. Maybe you have to grab something from the aircraft because you don't leave anything. Right. You can't leave it. You destroy it. So, you know, and that puts into a whole nother thing. Are you making more noise out there than you need to because you got to destroy this aircraft and then take them and out of know, there? So I forgot to factor in, Dave, you Marines tend to be sort of huskier guys. I mean, like 200 pounds plus is the norm, isn't it? Right. Plus our, you know, our flak jacket alone, just the, the vest that we wear is another 20, 30 pounds. The ammunition that you're carrying is another 10, 20 pounds. The water that you're carrying is another five, 10 pounds. So all in all, I weigh 220 pounds fully geared up. I'm probably weighing around 280 pounds. Wow. Okay. I want to put some cool stuff on this. First of all, can there be a helmet that has built in night vision goggles? <gasps> because really oh, like traveling at night is the safest thing, right? Yes. So yeah, no lights, absolutely. night vision goggles. Also, can this motorcycle have some sort of a, a sonar on it so it can get a bead or a heat? What do you call it, like a, uh, a heat tracker? Like a topo? Yeah, so it has a screen so you can mm -hmm. see if there's any um, anyone around you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so you're talking like any kind of sensor that would – I would almost think if you could have reconnaissance in the air, radar, you know, you have some – Right. And then they could be feeding down to you. You know, there's multiple heat signatures here. You know, there's guys on the ground over here. Oh, all assuming. It has to have a drone. It has to have a drone, right? Oh, yeah. Right. So you can send the drone up and see what the drone is seeing to see if you got a clear path. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. We're getting there. What other cool things does this bike need to be able to have? Well, Special Forces is currently using a, something called a Cristiani. All wheel yeah, drive. That's all two wheel drive. Yeah. yeah. Dirt bike. Yeah. And, uh, and they're using KLX, uh, one tens also for oh. the, the uh, air force, uh, what's their, their FSOC, the ones that go out and find the pilots that are down. Yeah. They're, uh, they're using KLXs probably because they're easy to get, get out there. So, yeah. All right. What other cool stuff do you want on this bike, Davey? Let's just say you're, you're, they're asking you like, what are all the things you want? All the things I want. Well, communication is key so i definitely yeah, want an antenna yeah. sticking you know 10 feet out i don't care how yeah. silly that looks but if i can't get comms which yeah. comms always go down then i'm kind of yeah. sol trying to find my own way back and i like what you have with the radar but maybe even that interface in with some kind of uh gps coordination maybe it has mm -hmm. a uh, a lot of our humvees and everything like that have signal jammers so if you're rolling through mm -hmm. you can't no one can trip you know, an IED or anything like that, or no one can make a call out yeah. saying, oh, that's cool. Hey, this yeah. person's going, it, you know, something like that. So all of a sudden their phone's not working as I'm trying to fly by. I think a laser beam, definitely a laser. What's the laser for? No, for <laughs> <you're> killing people. <laughs> no, because if you see, if you see an enemy, you want to kill them. So you can just press the laser beam and it's silent. It's silent. It just slice them in half like a piece of salami. Oh, just only the red shirt guys, right? Yeah, exactly. Just this the guys. Now we're talking James Bond, so we're in a whole Star different. No, Star Trek. Trek. Lasers no, hold on. Now that can cut people in okay, two. Okay, so but no, you did bring up a good point, Davey. What kind of weapon needs to be uh, 
affixed to this? Now, when it comes to weaponry, that's where it always gets kind of tricky because, you know, as a gunner, you want to be able to have full sections of fire and you want to be able to, you cover your section of fire, you get your slice of pie. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm not going to change to this lateral limit. So when they put those machine guns in the front, it's like, oh yeah, this is great if you're heading straight on and they just so <laughs> happen to be right in between those crosshairs. But I'd much rather maybe focus on going where my guy in tow has his own little, you oh, know, maybe right. 180 cockpit that he can shoot in a 180 degree. He can't go any further behind me, shooting at me behind him. You know, so the, so the trailer like would be uh, outfitted with. So let me ask a sacrilegious oh, I like question. I like that. Sure. Is a quad a better <laughs> thing for this than a motorcycle? Sacrilegious. I know. I know we're a motorcycle <laughs> podcast, but everything you're saying, I mean, you can mount a mount a 50 caliber in the back of a quad. That would be super cool. And, yeah, uh, heavy as hell. <laughs> it would you be, know, yeah. and and that's you know maybe even we don't go quite so sacrilegious. We do a trike or something like that. Like two wheels <laughs> in the you. front. <laughs> in <a> quad. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, quads are, so the newest thing that we've been getting is the, I can't even remember what it is, but it's basically just a four wheeler, right? It has a roll cage on it. That's what all of our special. Side by, like a side by side. Yeah, exactly. Super lightweight, something that you could drop in, something that you could drive around. The only issue is that they're super light. So they get stuck in sand. So you're having these guys going and all of a sudden hit some moon sand and have to dig everything out in order to move them forward. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I think, I mean, I think we have kind of an idea, fun something, but now I want to, I want to pivot this, Davey. Mm-hmm. You still get to decide, but now I want you to design the new GI Joe motorcycle oh. for kids. Oh, for What's kids, What's going to be on that? Oh, it's going to have the double, you know, the <laughs> big old Gatling gun right up center. It's going to have the two missiles on the side. So now you can shoot anything out. <laughs> IR lasers. You're going to so, have Emma, the, you can have the laser on the kids toy. How about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like fun. I mean, that's the thing. I know that everything has changed. And to me, it seems like there would have to be more technology and electronics. And I think like the drone, you can have a, a follow drone. Mm-hmm. Well, but then again, I don't know that you want to follow the drone. They no. just follow the drone. <laughs> um, it is quite interesting. And and I know that there's, uh, I mean, it comes down to you want electric that's quiet, but then you need to be able to find fuel sources. So I I'm, I still think that a well-packed um, dirt bike might be the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, not to mention, I don't know if you guys have ever used night vision goggles, but it, depth perception is extremely hard on you. Mm. But you're you're riding along and you can't tell if you're going to drop off the side or, <laughs> you know, like it's really hard to do that. So it's an electric motorcycle would be nice because it'd be nimble. You'd be able to move and everything like that. The only issue is if you're going through anything super dicey, right. you might have a little bit, you know, I have to slow down. I got it. And, I got it. A Suron. Emma, what do you think about that? You got an electric, uh, small dis- small bike right. with pedals in case you run out of juice. Yes, that you can affix, uh, you know, water and um, and a gun and stuff to your comms. All your stuff can go on it. Right. A Suron. Do you do you know what a Suron is, Davey? Uh, uh, no. <clears throat> was it S U R O N? Yes. Yeah, S U R O N. It is. Uh, it's a little. Okay. Electric. This is like what I was describing before, but the electric version. Gotcha. Um, it's almost like a trials bike, but electric. Yeah, exactly. Like. Very lightweight. I think that might be the thing to do. And it wouldn't take that long to charge. You could probably bring out the solar and hide during the day, and then mm-hmm. ride at night with your night vision. I think we might be on with something. Dod, here we come. Yeah, can you put in a, a request to get a Suron? Uh, I'll submit a query for us. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I wanted to thank you for coming on and helping us design the military bike because I just I just know that like everything has changed. It's not the way it used to be, but I still think that there's um, a good need for motorcycles. Plus, I know that um, you know they learned a hard lesson back. Uh, Early on, when they used to drop the horses out on parachutes, it didn't always end well. <laughs> no. So the motorcycles so. were much better to drop oh, out of a plane. That's kind of sad. 
<laughs> I know. I know. Well, thank you, Davey, for joining us. And I hope you uh, come by the garage again soon. Yeah, of course. I'll have to stop by before I head on out there. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. You guys have a good night. All right. See you, Davey. Ciao, Dave. Yes. Bye, Dave. Take care. So <clears throat> there, there it is. Our Memorial Day, you know, design a bike special. It, it really is... Um, it is interesting that yeah you know, the need has changed so much. Well, it hasn't. It hasn't. I mean, it still distills down to that very, very early concept of being able to get places quickly and efficiently. Yeah, yeah. I agree. But I wanted to take uh, time to get to. Uh, we got a lot of emails. Oh, a lot of emails. So let me hand some out. So, but. First of all, we got to catch up on some of our topics because we had a few people respond to the question, what bike would Steve McQueen be riding? Mm -hmm. um, so first off, we've got, oh, this is an interesting name. Uh, I'm going to say Ajars. Ajars? A-I-G-A-R-S? Would that be Ajars? Sure. Ayers, maybe? I Ayers? All right. Um, he says... His guess is that he would be loyal to Triumph bikes, so he thinks it would be a Triumph Scrambler 1200. And that we were talking earlier yeah, about that, the, I mean, the Bud Eakin special, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Steve McQueen loved Triumphs. Um, and whether he would stay loyal to the brand or not, you know, I like to think he would. Um, he, he, he was kind of like us. I mean, he loved all bikes. Well, he did um, ride at Elsinore too, right? Yeah, he rode in Elsinore. Yeah. He rode Huskies. Yep. Um, but there was always this place in his heart for Triumphs. Mm -hmm. um, always. I mean, it was kind of his to go bike. Right. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'll I'll stick with that. Um, I might be a bit partial, but I um, will stick that he would he would stick with British bikes. Well, Albert says if Steve McQueen were alive today, um, he would wouldn't be riding a trike uh, because he'd be 91 years old. He'd probably be riding a sidecar <laughs> rig. Therefore, he'd be riding a Ural. Um, oh, Style-wise, wow. this would remind him of one of his best movies, The Great Escape. But he would want to ride the 1200 Bonneville, the Bud Eakins Special Edition. Right. Um, he, he, but he, I also know that he loved Huskies and all that exotic dirt and desert race stuff. Which the Ducati Desert Sled would also yeah I was be gonna I was gonna say that I think the one thing about McQueen is that he always wanted the fastest mm -hmm. in the in the technological so I could see him on a on a Ducati. Um, yeah, there's I think uh, I mean you're talking about what's the cool of cool I don't know D Desert Sled or the Triumph Scrambler is pretty cool I, right. I'm gonna go with that one I think um, Emma I gave an email to you yes you did. Um, what you got there? Okay, this is Kyle from Canada Land. Hello, Misfits. Last year, I bought a 2008 FZ6. Of course, he's Canadian, so he'll say FZ6. At the end of the summer, with 25,000 kilometers on it, which is about 15,000 miles. When I got it out of storage this year, I had noticed my bike running warmer than last season and found a coolant leak from a rusted pinhole in the connector pipe a couple of weeks ago. Upon replacing the pipe, I flushed and refilled the coolant system with what, which by the looks of it had never been done before. And you know what, Kyle, that isn't uncommon. Um, a lot of people forget to flush the cooling system. Which, excuse me. Oh, um, Emma, I can't believe you're yawning after that big nap you had I'm, yeah. you know, and, <laughs> I'm and I, sorry and I, and I had to say that um i said I, to everyone earlier you missed this i said as impressive of a mechanic that emma is the thing that impresses me the most is her ability to fall asleep anywhere anytime oh yeah <laughs> and and like the dead but we learned this when you fell asleep under the bus at vintage days the thing you need i mean you kind of found out early on 
but a lot of people have thought I've died, and I'm just yeah. Sleeping. We were like poking you with sticks. Yeah, I was like, like checking you out to see is like she is she gonna make it through this? Yeah, no, I mean it's you look dead when you sleep. It's I know scary. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it looked like yeah. It at least like <laughs> at I was least, a little creeped I mean, out. I'm, at least I, at least I close my <laughs> eyes now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I never used to. Okay. Um, well, you better check yourself in the mirror because we might have drawn something on your face. Okay, very good. <laughs> oh, um, so where were we? Never been done before. However, even at highway speeds, the engine temps surpass the uh, 150, 565 they held constantly last season and slowly creep up past 212 showing no sign of stopping even once the fan comes on. That concerns me. Um, and even having the high temp light come on after 20 minutes of riding last weekend, so it's obviously getting warm. Along with a coolant flush, I've tested the thermostat in a pot of boiling water and it opens and closes at the appropriate temperature. Very good. I'm not 100% sure it opens enough. See picture. Yes, it does. Well, while bleeding the cooling system, the coolant level drops at the RAV rev cap if i rev the engine so the water pump seems to be working properly and squeezing all the hoses disturbs the coolant at the rad cap leading to believe they are free of blockages are these bikes susceptible to air in the system that i should be bleeding it multiple times or am i looking at something more sinister like a blocked radiator thanks for the help and hoping to hear your thoughts on the podcast tonight keep up the great work exclamation point um, Kyle. So look, Kyle, FC6, there's nothing really special about that cooling system. Um, what you should do, you always fill it from the radiator. And I mean, you burp it, certainly. So you, you basically, you run it up and um, you'll find that when the thermostat begins to open, the level will drop. So you take the cap off, you fill it up as much as you can, and then you rev it. And one of two things will happen. Either it'll drop when the thermostat opens, but the FC6 has got quite a sizable bypass on it. So it'll actually probably start rising. And that's kind of it. Put the cap back on and just top it off. And it shouldn't, it's obviously getting warm. So there's something going on there. Um, if you had a pinhole in a pipe, you've got some corrosion going on in there. So you're really going to have to investigate why this thing's getting so warm. Um, check your oil. Check that the engine isn't making the rest of the bike hot before you just start pulling the um, cooling system apart. You should always be using good quality oil, of course. FC6s don't take much oil. They take about two and a half quarts. Um Use a good quality oil. Make sure you're using good quality coolant. Um, why would it be getting hot? Um, the engine could be overheating because of poor oil or low oil. There could be a blockage in the system, which is potential because we already established there was a corrosion pinhole in one of the um, the lines. You may have blown a head gasket. It may be pressurizing the system. I doubt yeah. it, though, because you'd be you'd have water in the oil, oil in the water, and it'd be throwing a load of coolant out of the exhaust system. Um, just check everything carefully, really carefully. Um, simple stuff first. Get into the difficult stuff later. I mean, the thing is with FC sixes, essentially for all their performance, they're not a complex bike. And getting at all the components on the cooling system are not majorly hard. Um, I would say you've either got an overheating engine because it's got oil problems, something maybe as simple as the oil being crap or the oil being low, or you've got a blockage in the cooling system somewhere. And that's going to be easy to find when you dismantle it. There you go. There you go. Good luck. Um, Keep us in the loop. <clears throat> I have one real quick, and this is from our friend Daniel, who has a nominee for the top 10 most misunderstood bikes. We're still working on this list. <clears throat> and Emma. Hello. He thinks uh, you, you may agree with him. Let's see. He would like to nominate the Honda Fury. 
So, John, you remember we you saw Honda Fury for the first time when we were out at that dealership in Hollister. Oh, the Honda yeah, Fury. Right. Yeah. The Honda Fury, you're right. <laughs> he says uh, the ability to buy a chopper for 12000 out the door yes. is still unheard of, Yes. let alone one you can ride well. There's yes. nothing else like it on the market now. Yes. Some competitors have gone come and gone, such as the Harley Rocker and the Yamaha Raider. Yes. You could also argue Harley's late breakout was similar as a fashion statement, though more dragster than chopper. Regardless, Honda has outlasted them all. The Fury was always cheaper by at least two stacks of hard-earned wages, affordable quality, and fashion. It's like buying Levi's at Walmart. Yeah, I was totally impressed with that bike when I saw it. In <laughs> fact, I never even heard of it, and we saw it at that dealership. And what a well-put-together, you know, fit well, and finish it, it, was incredible. It, it comes in two flavors. It comes in furry flavor which has got the long forks and then saber flavor, which is exactly the same bike with, uh -huh. with shorter forks. Hmm. Um, they are good bikes. I think they came too late. It's yeah, it, missed it by 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. I mean, that's the argument is number one, but anything that is that polarizing, that's that narrow of an appeal. I think a lot of the commonality of the best bikes, a lot of the commonality of the great bikes is they have crossover appeal. Well, and it could be said that this might be part of Honda's genius because Honda, even though the market was kind of passed, there was still a piece of it there. Oh, sure. And they're taking, the engine is from a VTX, right? Right. So they're taking leftover parts, much like the, as he pointed out himself in this email, the Honda CB900C which was a predecessor to, you know, it was a muscle, right. a muscle cruiser yes. before there really were any. Right. Um, and that was also a extra parts bike that they right. used parts from you know, the CB900 Super Sport from right. the Goldwing. And they made something new to kind of, even though it wasn't a huge market, but to get a little well, more I, out of it. I know I've mentioned this before. I mean, Soishiro Honda's vision always has been and the company have, have never really deviated from this is we are going to make a bike for everyone mm -hmm. absolutely everyone you it, it's whether you like it or not and so that explains some of the weird and wacky creations over the years but honda make a bike for everyone and that explains the fury perfectly and they are great bikes and the, you can buy one off the showroom floor and it looks like a million bucks and you can just do a small amount of customizing on it. And it looks as good as anything that subtle father and son team made yeah. with just a tiny amount of customizing. Um, they, they are amazing bikes, but do they belong on a top 10 list? It's such a polarizing bike. I think it, I think it actually fits perfectly the definition of a misunderstood bike because the it's made to be an affordable chopper but anyone in the chopper or big twin crowd has They're no respect for it. To it yeah. No respect for it. It's not Harley. Well, I don't <laughs> not sure whether it's well known enough to be misunderstood though. Mm. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Um it's it, 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 yeah, maybe. Maybe. I'll think about it. Okay. I'll think, think about it. it. You think about that while John reads an email. All right. I get, we got an email from Tim from Costa Rica. And, hey, uh, hey, Tim. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase some of this. But basically, Tim has been riding for 20 years. He had a Harley <laughs> and eventually traded it in for a DRZ 400 S SM. And, uh, and some of his friends took him off road and he got the bug just like, Naked Jim and myself and a bunch of others, and uh, and really has gone whole hog into uh, into riding off road in Costa Rica. What a fabulous place to be riding off road! So, uh, you know, he's fifty years old, little little younger than me, and has just been getting into it wholehearted. So now he currently owns a KTM nine ninety ADV, a six ninety Enduro, which he uses on the trails, and then a funky old what he says a funky old O O four Multistrada that he can't get himself to can't bring himself to sell. So, but he's also considering now something smaller, like a WR two fifty F, and but has asked, mm -hmm. ha, has a question about whether um, whether it'll be a big enough difference from the six ninety in weight and reliability for solo kind of solo camping and solo survival, and he's asking if we have any thoughts about that. 
Uh, yeah, I would say yeah. I would say that I that's know. probably. I mean, the WR250 is a fantastic motorcycle, and I think it'll go just about anywhere. And it's and it and it. I don't I don't have the the specs in front of me, but it's got to be lighter fe lighter feeling, yeah. if not actually lighter than when you're comparing like all the the 250s. And we've said or Emma right. said the WR has probably got a little more pump than the others. Yeah, right, a little more. Yeah, but not a huge amount of difference. No, I mean it's no. it's it's it's, just, it's got one more valve. Um. Which equates to a little more, but um, it's just, it's such a good all rounder. Yeah. My two favorite 250s, it's the WR and the KLX. Very good bikes. Yeah. Really, both fabulous bikes. Well, to that, he might want to look at the new KLX 300, which just came out. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I rode that at Jocelyn's place and it's a fabulous little bike. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 300 is the 250 of, to, of That's yes. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, everyone's going to the 300s now. Um, they're all good. Yes. That's my opinion. They're all good. And I mean, that, that's a very, very valid point. You've really got to work very hard to buy a crappy motorcycle these days. I mean, even a 250. I mean, even if you went, did something nuts and bought one of the California Scooter Company, the CSC 250s. Right. I'm hearing good reviews from those too. I was in the desert where the guys were riding one of the SRSs, and that, that was a fabulous bike too. There's not many 250s that yeah. are going to be that bad. No. Just get whatever oper I mean, especially now with so many bikes not being available and, and prices being up there, and any opportunity. You're almost for better it. off getting new at this point than buying a used, yeah, yeah, overpriced yeah. used bike. Get what you can and just enjoy it. That's the truth. Because it'll be brilliant. Um, Bagel, you have an email there? I just got one in. And, <clears throat> and it, yes. Yeah. Yes. I think uh, I maybe also gave you the printed version, one of you two. So he's going to read it. Make sure you don't read it also. Okay. Go ahead, Bagel. Okay. So this is an email from Robert Taylor. <clears throat> Robert writes Hey there, Misfits. Robert from Florida here. Glad to hear you guys are able to hang out in the studio again. I was prowling YouTube recently and came across the regular car review of the Honda CB900 Custom, oh, which has a again. transfer case of all things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Regular went into a little bit of detail about the bike and all its quirkiness, and I recently spotted one for sale nearby. I don't think I'll be buying it, but it made me wonder if perhaps Miss Emma might have some history hall knowledge about this thing. Safe riding, Robert. <laughs> um. Yeah, they, I mean, they were, for a while, they were the longest wheelbase motorbike you could buy. Well, I actually had one. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a thing. It's a, a 900 Super Sport engine, which is, you know, not a massive powerhouse. It's about 86 horsepower, 85 horsepower. Um, and then it's got this high and low shift. So basically, you've got 10, 10 means of forward propulsion. They're, uh, they're quite a good bike. I'll tell you why I liked it. Um, so I took it for a ride. I only rode it a couple times because we were, you know, I got it as a free bike. Right. It was a bit junker and we just did fun, crazy things with it. Actually, I don't, you never saw it, John. I didn't know. Uh, Doug and I uh, built it. I wanted to have the challenge of building a bike you could carry a keg of beer on. Mm. And so <laughs> we actually it had no back seat. It had a solo saddle from a Harley, and then it had a flat. Or it had like a pickup truck with the uh, with the wooden side rails and a fold down rear. Uh, <laughs> it had oh, a flat bed on the back of it. So, and also you could put a stack of large pizzas in there. Oh, there you go. So I built it out just nice. you know as a fun bike. But I went. I took it up riding in the hills, and what I discovered was at first when you're trying to figure out this, uh, ten gears. So basically, you've got five gears. Uh, on, on low and five gears on high. So either when you're on low, you're shifting through one, three, five, seven, nine. And when you're on high, you're shifting through two, four, six, eight, ten. Well, when we're getting into the twisties, like with many bikes, when you have a bike that's not geared exactly for that type of riding, you end up having to downshift into the turns and then shift uh, out when you're pulling out, right? And I was doing that, which is a little bit slower riding because you want to be able to get the engine braking and power out. Once I switched it to from one three five to two four six, I found it to be in the perfect band that all I had to do was throttle down to get the engine braking and then throttle out of the turns. Does that make mm. sense? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Nice. And I was like, this is great. You're basically able to kind of tune 
the the bike to the riding you're doing at that moment. You're tuning your gearing at least. Tuning right. your gearing exactly. Yeah. And so I really appreciated it for that. Cool. Uh, yeah. Neat. So, um, John, you, do you have another one there? I do. I do. This is from <clears throat> Marcus R. Hey, Marcus. And he says, hello, misfits. Marcus Welby, MD. <laughs> wow. You're, showing you're dating me. yourself. You told Marcus, me Marcus R. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, go, oh, I almost sorry. went down your history hole on that one, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do since that. She's dated herself. Let me date myself as well. Did uh -huh. you know that the Marcus Welby house was also the Leave It to Beaver house? Really? I yes. never knew that. I All the listeners. On the back lot at Universal So on a scale from one to ten, how boring do you think this conversation is? Well, I think for the for the under 50s, they're all like, who the hell is Marcus Welby and all the old 50s are just having That's this true. nostalgic rush. Well, we're getting like the Cleveland Moto podcast here. And we're going way off topic. No. <laughs> <laughs> to our left. <laughs> so I've been listening to the podcast for, um, for about half a year now, and I enjoy it very much. As a matter of fact, I listen to you guys when I'm in my workshop working on one of my motorcycles. Cool. I've had this workshop for a couple of years now, and uh, and once in a while, some bloke comes by and asks me whether I fix motorcycles, and I always say no. After listen <laughs> That's very smart. You should uh, never fix uh, motorcycles. Well, pay, and pay attention. Yeah, pay attention because you're in the next paragraph. So <laughs> after listening to Emma's story about opening her own shop, I started to think why I don't start fixing bikes here and there. Nothing major, small stuff, maintenance, and no electronics. So last week, somebody came by and asked me whether I can fix his leaking fork seals. I said, sure. I ordered the seals, and he brought the bike to me on Saturday. When he brings the bike, he tells me the forks always bought him out. That's uh, what he really needed to have fixed. And at this point, I should have just sent him home and told him to come back when he had gotten new springs. But, but my mind was single-tracked and focused on replacing the seals. So I did it. No problem. Everything went well. Halfway through the repair, the man texts me not to put it back together if the springs are bad. Needless to say... I have no way of testing springs for their elasticity, so I proceeded to finish the fork seals. When the guy picks up his bike, it did not start initially. I didn't start it while I had to fix it, and he starts to get grumpy, accusing me of breaking his bike. All in all, interesting experience. I should have spent more time figuring out exactly what was wrong with the bike instead of taking his initial word for it, fork seals only. Emma, how do you deal with a customer who brings you a bike and then accuses you of putting scratches on it or blaming you that your bike won't start? What about parts you order for a customer? Ooh. What if he disappears after I order a three hundred dollar part? Anyhow, next time I'll be a bit more careful when I accept when I accept for repair work. All my all my bikes are old, and I do most are most familiar with older bikes. My neighbor here in Concord says, "Okay, my neighbor here in Concord was an old Brit who restored British bikes. I forgot his name. I think he died a year ago, and the landlord sold or gave away gave away everything in his workshop. I wonder if Emma knows what happened to him." Well, hopefully I'll make it to Santa Cruz this year and pay you misfits a visit. My girlfriend says I am so misfitting that I won't fit in with you. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. That's Marcus <laughs> from Concord in Oakland. So there's a couple of questions here for you, Emma. The first is, um, so should he have spent more time figuring out exactly yes. what was wrong with the bike instead of yes. taking this award for Ooh, can, can I jump in? Yeah. Uh, this is something that I use in, in my business, uh, working in hardware, hardware stores. Okay. And I, when I'm training the hardware store employees, I say, give them what they need, not what they want. Right. You have to assume you know more than they do. Right. And that you have to ask them some questions before you sell them something. Right. And it sounds like that's the same thing. Give them what they need, not what they want. It is. Um when you when you arrive at my shop, the very first thing I do you see is an evil can evil poster that I gave you. You see the evil can evil <laughs> poster, and I will walk out to the customer with my clipboard and a handwritten invoice, and the handwritten invoice stays with the bike, and eventually is returned to the customer, filled out, and so we go over the bike. And I take the mileage and I take the chassis number and I take the customer's name and phone number and all the contact details. So I know who they are. And the important thing is, as I'm doing this, I'm walking around the bike and I'm looking for any obvious damage because 
you know, the last thing you want is somebody to bring down something pristine and say, you caused that gouge on the tank. And if I say a gouge on the tank, I say, hey, there's a gouge on the tank. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, know about that. And I'll, I'll write it on the invoice. Mm -hmm. Has gouge on the tank. And I'll do a little sketch of the bike. But my favorite part, every single invoice gets written the same. There's right under where the details of them and the bike are, I put customer states one forks are leaking two forks are bottoming out three blah 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 so what went wrong with this fella well fixing other people's bikes out of your garage i don't want to try and put you off but it is a bit of a mugs game because if he crashes his bike and blames you and initially he sounds like he might be the kind of person that do that he could sue you for everything you own oh yeah um yeah. i spent a huge amount of money for insurance for my shop let's i mean i want to make people make sure that people understand that if you want to open a bike shop you don't just put oh yes you know it's hang a shingle yeah, yeah joe's bike shop you have to find property and find property that is zoned correctly for what you want to do in the case of california it's zoned industrial so you need to find industrial property you need to sign a lease you need to get the correct equipment in to actually work on the bike so if you're doing just something as simple as fork seals you need fork seal drivers you need a fork level gauge you need a ratio right so you can measure the exact amount of oil going in. You need access to the specs, blah, blah, blah. Are you saying there's too much risk at being a shade tree mechanic? I think there is now. Okay. Well, the other question you had, which I think I can answer even myself, is what if somebody disappears after I order a $300 part? Well, my guess is I'm going to take your bike in first, then I'll order the parts oh. and you won't get it back until... It's called a lean sale. Yeah. Right, exactly. And I mean, th th this is the advantage I've got because I've got an 800 square foot workshop at my disposal, right. which is very small by commercial standards. But people don't bring me the bike and say, oh, can you do the fork seals and blah, 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 and I'll bring it next week. People drop off their bike right? and I order the parts. So... Yeah, as long as the bike's worth more than 300 bucks, I'm happy. And you know, this is one of the reasons why many shops won't work on these Chinese bikes. Right. Not because they can't yeah. fix them, but because so many people abandon them. Right. Because they paid 600 bucks for it. And now they get a yeah, well, $500 it is, you know, bill for simple it, it, stuff and they just leave it there. Exactly. And I always yeah. give people options. It's a great example. Just before I closed on Friday, um, an 1100 shadow arrived and the guy just resurrected it from a 10 year slumber and he was riding it down the freeway and it stopped. And of course the gas tank's full of rust. So the filter's probably clogged and I'm sure the fuel pump clogged as well. And I said, look, I'm going to give you various options to fix it, but I'm going to give you my recommendation it is I like putting genuine parts on these bikes. We can go onto eBay right now and I can probably find you a fuel pump for 30 bucks but it's going to be a $30 fuel pump. And my recommendation to you is when you come back and see me at the shop, I'd far rather have a nice, oh, hey, Emma, how are you doing today? I just stopped by to say hi and have a cup of coffee and not, oh, hey, Emma, my bloody bike broke down again. Right. So I would far rather you spend the $140 on the genuine Honda fuel pump, please. And putting it like that, he's like, oh, yes, that's very good, very good. Put the genuine Honda fuel pump on it. And all the time, but the point I'm making is all the time I'm figuring out, I'm sussing out the customer. And if they're kind of weird and shady and combative, remember, if you run your own shop, the management, that's you, has the right to, re to refuse service to anyone. That's him. So basically i mean to cut a long story short if i get any weird people in the shop it's kind of no i'm not going to fix your bike so here's what I, i'm going to give some uh, bad advice mm. maybe you should start uh, as a shade tree mechanic only working on chinese bikes that no one else will work <laughs> on <laughs> and then you're going to end up with a nice little uh, selection of used bikes right. to sell <laughs>
Uh, well, is no, that that, don't run, you mean? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it is. It is a <clears throat> huge risk. It's. I mean, it's yeah. tough. It really is tough. I mean, when I in all the years I've been working on bikes, has everybody has everybody been happy? No, of course they haven't. I mean, you know, we we we're, we're human beings, but you know, I. I can honestly say I have never had somebody accuse me of making their bike run worse than they dropped it off. So now I have some good advice. Why don't you consider opening up a recycle garage like go. what we do here? That's a great idea. Somebody comes to there you, you they want help. Don't fix it for them. Mm -hmm. Help them fix it. Teach them, show them how. I've been doing this for many years before Emma came, doing stuff I didn't know how to do, right. but I'd pull out a manual or I'd buy the tool because we would learn it together. There's enough instruction out there. Um, that's what I would suggest you do if you want to have fun, meet people, build a little community, and have people around. Uh, uh, you know, it's fun. So that's what I would suggest help them and yes. teach them. Absolutely. But don't do it for them. It's a great idea. I, I think it's a better idea. And it all depends on, on your motivation. I mean, if, if you're planning on making a living doing this, you've got to do it properly. Conversely, if you just want to have some fun, hang out with people, open the, uh, open the garage collective. It's a far better way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I did some sums that, um, and it, believe me, it's very, very small, but I need to make quite a few thousand dollars before I even break even every month. Mm -hmm. By the time I've paid the property, the insurance, especially the liability insurance, the utilities, the, the permits, you know, the, um, I just had waste tires collected. That was a hundred bucks just to get my waist tires right. hauled away. And then uh, fluids yeah. and all that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just everything. Write a check, write a check, write a check, write a check, write a check. And it's fine. I'm not complaining because it basically means that my grandchildren are going to have a lovely place to live and mm -hmm. it's not going to be a complete frigging dump. But it costs money and that's why it costs a lot of money to have your bike worked on at a bike shop. Yeah. All right, we got time for one more email and this is a good one. Because this covers everything. Oh, blimey. Well, wow. so, and it's from a friend of ours. So you know how oh. we've we've stirred a lot of shit up and we had Ivamoto. <laughs> Those then, guys? Uh, yeah, and then Nokomoto and then creative writing, everyone commenting. Well, now we've got Ted from the Motorcycle Men. Well, Ted's oh, all right. But yeah. it's not about the top 10 list. He's got a lot to catch up on, on a lot of things we've been talking about. So first off, um, hey, Ted, um, he says, uh, as always, I appreciate Miss Emma's input, insight, and brilliance on the subject of motorcycles, and her comments on the Pan America were spot on. In fact, all of the comments from everyone on the show were also spot on. Uh, so he had the opportunity to ride the Pan America a couple of weeks ago, um, and he rode, uh, let's see, the, the Pan America and Pan America S, he, he rode the S model where he thought, thought the uh, active suspension was crazy good. Um, the lowering of the bike uh, when you come to a stop was so subtle, he didn't even notice it, but the overall comfort of the seat and ergonomics of the bike was stellar. And as you know, I'm a cruiser guy and comfort is paramount. Mm. Um, he thought the handling of the bike was uh, amazing considering its size. It felt light and nimble, not at all imposing as it may appear. The brakes were eye-opening. Oh, you want to stop? Let's do that right now. <laughs> uh, Needs to say they were good. He says uh, if he has one complaint, it would be the turn signals. So for any uh, Harley rider, you know that they have kind of like BMW's uh, left, left and right left. controls. But if you notice, the spike didn't. It had a standard right. yes. left mm. thumb control. They had a lot of buttons everywhere, too, on that bike. Suck it up, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Kettler. Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Turn signals are normal, but they're weird on traditional yeah, highways. And, and why aren't they self-canceling, he wants to know. That's a good well, question. A good hmm. So he says, yes, I would own one and ride the crap out of it. Its pricing is affordable in, and in that ADV sweet spot. That being said, and repeating what I have personally heard from Harley employees who Harley put on the Pan Am, the BMW, the Honda, the KTM, Ducati, Yamaha, and Suzuki, in their words, the other manufacturers should be worried about their sales. Hmm. Hmm. Um, 
So he says now in, with regard to the live wire, he's written it on two separate all day occasions. And without question, he desperately wishes there to be one in his garage right now. Mm. Okay. So this is great. Ted, yeah. you're branching out. This is what I love because for somebody who is a traditional cruiser guy through Harley is now experiencing adventure and electric. They're opening more doors for people. I really like that. Um, Let's see. Uh, he says, uh, if I were to make a list similar to what you and Phil and the other podcast made up, it is likely to include more than just Harley Davidson's. And I'd be glad to provide that list. Good. Hmm. Um, he says, with regard to the most misunderstood motorcycles, yes. the V rod tops the list followed very closely by the XR 1200. And also he would put on that list, the can am spider mm. Hmm. and the yeah. sportster should also be on that list because so many consider it a woman or a women's or beginner's bike and they are not they are quite nimble nope. and fun those are good points uh i can't have spider i'm not going to put on most no i don't think so list. the v-rod i don't think it was misunderstood i think it had a niche it was in it did very good the in that niche i think harley didn't do it good i know people who had issues with the quality of it that porsche motor was pretty phenomenal though. yeah but i knew somebody who had one brand new that had electrical problems they could right. never figure yeah. out mm. yeah. um it, i mean it wasn't it it wasn't released at a great time for harley quality control mm. i think yeah. perhaps if it had been released can you imagine what would have happened if it had been released during the amf years yeah. <laughs> wow yeah. um it would it would have been very handsome though um i don't yeah i don't think it was misunderstood i think it it, it had its niche it, it had its time they're not going forward with it but i think they're going to continue to be very collectible bikes because oh, everyone yeah. knows exactly yeah what they're good for um they look very good in the orange and silver and he says, uh, during the segment about misunderstood bikes, when Liza read a list from a listener that included the Yamaha XR XS, Emma said the words, complete pile of shit. I nearly <laughs> spit out the mouthful of English breakfast. Tea. <laughs> Thanks so much for that colorful, colorful commentary. And then lastly, what would Steve McQueen be writing today? He says either an Arch Method 143 Mm. Or a restored Bruff Superior SS1000. Mm. Potentially, Ooh. yes. Oh. Mm. You know, actually, I think Ted's on to something there. I think he might actually go for an arch. I think, Because he, yeah. he'd certainly appreciate the engineering. And I, I've heard that they move along quite well. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm told that our very own misfit, Mike, Mikey three times and Keanu Reeves are like brothers. <laughs> and so perhaps Fun I on. might be able to get a test ride on one, but I've heard they move quite well. Yeah. Um, and you need to be extremely well healed to own one. And yeah. I mean, Steve McQueen was quite a wealthy guy. So I, I think you're right. It could be. Yeah. It, it, you know, it could be um, either that or a Confederate Hellcat. Mm. Ooh. I, I can't see him on that. You can't see him on a no, because I, yeah. I think it's just too much. It's too the handling is not there, and I, sort of. I'm going to stick with. I really think a Ducati uh, Desert Slide. Uh, no, that's a cool bike. It's a bike he could take anywhere. Well, you had an interesting point sure. earlier where you said there's Steve McQueen, and then there's the Harvey Mushman. Yeah. Conversation. Yeah. So what would Harvey ride? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, a Husky. 701. <laughs> mm. I don't know. <laughs> um, hey, Bagel, yeah. I got a question for you. What are you doing July 22nd through 25th? Uh, is that the weekend of Vintage Motorcycle Days? It is. Um, I am hoping that I might be able to make it out there. I'm still trying to get a time off from work. I don't know if I can get it, but if I can, I'm, I'll am i be there. Work is overrated, Bagel. Yes, well, it is. nothing is, is really in set in stone yet oh. but it is looking very likely that emma and stumpy john and i will be heading out there nice. and that uh, we'll be doing a little live podcast for oh, hey. come join us and it might right. be cleveland moto guys yeah, and yeah. it might be like a town hall debate 
<laughs> Ooh. There might be a top 10 list involved with this. <laughs> That's right. Wow. That's right. right. So stay tuned. We're going to be announcing that once we lock it in. But um, yeah, if you want to come join us, Bagel. Phil said yeah. he'll he'll supply a, a, a sleeping bag and a and a, a bus or vehicle to sleep under for Emma. Sweet. If I if I can make it, I'll be there. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the not a ramp. No. Yes. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> not a ramp is great. <laughs> yeah. You know what goes perfect with not a ramp? I take my evil Knievel suit and I find somebody. Yes. To put it on. Once they have it on, you can get them to do anything. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. And and John, I've already signed you up for the uh pit bike barrel race. Oh, I'm down. I'm down. I know you're fat down. man on a little bike. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I, I think that's that's it for this. So happy Memorial Day to yeah. everyone. Thanks to uh, um all the who fought and died. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you have ideas for the perfect military bike, what you would put on it, either the actual military bike or the G.I. Joe version. Because, I mean, come on. Like, we guys have to admit, they have to upgrade the G.I. Joe motorcycle. Right, Emma? Right. It's time. I uh, think so. Email us at RecycleMotorcycleGarage at gmail.com and let us know what you think would be uh, suitable on that bike. I like I like the uh I, I kind of want the night vision a motorcycle helmet now. Except oh, for the uh, whole the whole thing you can fall, not, yeah. fall off a cliff thing. <laughs> well, maybe maybe you set them out to the sides to get better stereo I, vision. I, I want a freaking laser. <laughs> Blast them. <laughs> oh, actually, um Davey sent me a message after he got off to you, uh, Emma. Oh. oh. He did, and he said, um Hey, thanks. That was really awesome. Please let Emma know I'm going to find that laser beam for her next military bike. <laughs> oh, oh, freaking lasers. Yeah, it's that's exactly what I was thinking. Laser. Laser. <laughs> but what I can see happening is, is she's going to order a laser for her military bike, and it's really just going to be a cat toy. Right, little cat toy lasers. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> It'll distract them. Yeah, because cats are okay. Nice. Um, also, big thanks to our Patreon subscribers. Who are Thank easily you. the most benevolent human beings in the world. Yeah. In the universe, in fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see I spent more money in the studio working on some of this uh I mean, the fact cable is, control. Um, without Patreon people, I mean, we couldn't be who we are. Yeah. You know, we would just fade into obscurity. Wow, and that's just, a scary thought. It is a scary thought. but it's deep, man. Yeah, it is deep. Oh. Why are any of us here, man? <laughs> oh, what a downer for Alaska. Um, did I tell you how much I like your T-shirt, Bagel? Oh, I thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Emma's Army. Yes. Which, if you're interested in an Emma's Army shirt, you can find it at our oh. Zazzle.com store. I believe it's just a recycle garage on Zazzle.com. Right. And we've got a few of our designs, but specifically the... Emma's yes, Army Emma's shirt Army. is a good one, and me in bed with some old Yamaha <laughs> is quite a popular <laughs> one as well. <laughs> yes, um, the original of that picture is hanging up in Moto Town as we speak. Um, right. And next week we have a cool guest joining us. I'm not going to tell you who yet. I'm going to tease Ooh. it out, but I'm going to mm. tell you somebody who's very familiar with the ADV market. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Mm. I know. So uh, we we might be talking about the Pan America again, and some of the <laughs> other ADV ADV bikes, like the Royal Enfield. Is it really? Is a Himalayan really an adventure bike? I think there's some of these bikes that are uh, adventure style, but not really adventure. I don't know. And I think he'll probably have a pretty good idea what um, oh, so like it, Steve McQueen it, would be writing. So it, it's mm. not a diminutive brunette woman then? No, it uh, is not. <laughs> okay. It is not. Okay. I think Sorry, Jocelyn. <laughs> not you. <laughs> but I think we're ready to get out of here. Um, thanks again, everyone, for listening. Don't forget to go to our um, YouTube channel if you would like to see the video of this that we are doing right now. There we go. Uh, thanks again, everyone. This is Liza. Emma Darling! Stumpy John. Bagel. And we're out of here. Cool. Bye-bye. Cool. cool. Whew.